Let's have a look at section 5.5, which is about defining sequences recursively. So the whole idea behind defining sequences recursively is that you are defining terms of the sequence based on previous terms. So the definition we have here is a recurrence relation for a sequence is a formula that relates each term a sub k to certain of its predecessors a sub k minus 1, a sub k minus 2, etc. Um, so that's just what that's just saying is that it's defining a sub k based on one or more of the terms that come before it. Okay. Um, in some examples, we'll see it's just the immediate term before it, but it can be more than one term, and it might not be the one right before it. Maybe it's, you know, two before it or something like that. Whenever you have a recurrence relation, you'll have something else called an initial condition. Uh, and an initial condition tells you how the sequence starts. Now, it might give you one term, or it might give you more than one term. But the reason these two things have to go together is if a recurrence relation is telling you how terms are defined based on previous terms, well, you, you have to start somewhere, right? And if at the very beginning of the sequence, there are no previous terms. Um, so that's why we need to at least know what the first term is, um, or perhaps the first few terms. So let's take a look at an exercise from section 5.5. This is exercise one. And the instructions are simply to find the first four terms of this recursively defined sequence. So we've got a sub k equals two times a sub k minus one plus k for all integers k greater than or equal to two. Okay, so starting with a sub two, we're going to do two times the term before plus whatever the index k is. Okay, now the initial condition is a sub 1 equals 1. So notice that recurrence relation applied for k greater than or equal to 2. And this initial condition tells us what a sub 1 is. So now we can look at the first four terms. Now we know the first term is 1. So a sub 1 is 1. a sub 2, according to the definition, would be 2 times a sub 1 plus 2. So 2 times a sub 1 plus 2 would be 2 times 1 plus 2, which is 4. Now we know a sub 2. So a sub 3 would be 2 times a sub 2 plus 3, according to that recurrence relation. Okay, that gives us 11. Now that we know a sub 3, we can calculate a sub 4. It would be 2 times a sub 3 plus 4, okay, which gives us 26. So those would be the first four terms of this sequence. So that's the idea. You've got a rule that tells you how to generate new terms. The trade-off is you need to know what the the term before it is before you can know what the next term is, you know. So, in other words, notice here, in order to figure out a sub 3, we needed to know a sub 2. In order to know a sub 4, we needed to know a sub 3. In the next section, we're going to talk about how you could take a recurrence relation and maybe come up with an explicit formula uh, which in some ways is going to be more useful. So let me uh, just briefly address that before we uh, wrap this up. Um, if we consider this sequence that we're talking about, this exercise one that we just looked at the first four terms, it would be a problem for us if it said, find the hundredth term of this sequence, especially if we didn't have the you know, technology to assist us with that. So if it said find the hundredth term, the problem with the recurrence relation is now we need to know what the 99th term is. But to know what the 99th term is, we need to know what the 98th term is. Um, 
so certainly technology could be very helpful for doing that quickly. Um, but to do this by hand, um, you know, we really don't have an alternative at this point uh, when we're working with a recurrence relation to just going through it term by term. Okay, but that's what the next section will address. Um, one other thing I want to mention uh, before we conclude this video is there's two examples, sort of famous examples, that are discussed in this section. And uh, while I won't get into those in detail here, I do want to emphasize that those are very worthwhile to look at. So I, I encourage you to look at these in the textbook. Um, one is the Tower of Hanoi. Um, this is a puzzle where you're moving some disks from one peg to another peg, and you've got a total of three of these um, different pegs. And there are some rules about how you can do it. You can't put a larger disk on top of a smaller disk. And the textbook gets into the whole um, description of that. But the idea is that solving this involves a recurrence relation. Um, if you know how to do that with three disks, you can use that solution to know how, how many moves it takes to do it with four disks. Okay, that's where the recurrence relation idea comes in. Um, another famous example is this Fibonacci sequence, which you might be familiar with where you're getting turns by adding the previous two terms. You start with one, and you've got one, and then you add those two to get the next term, and then you add two to get the the term after that and so forth. So you're always adding the previous two terms together. Um, the textbook gets into a description of how that sequence was in first um, used in the context of a, an example involving rabbit population. So something that's sort of unexpected, but it's an interesting um, read and some of the um, exercise in the textbook, look at both of these things, Tower of Hanoi and the Fibonacci sequence, and ask us, you know, if we modify the rules somewhat, either for the Tower of Hanoi or the, this rabbit population, um, how does that change the sequence? Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting uh, thing to, to take a look at. Um, the next section, as I mentioned, uh, gets into a way of taking recurrence relations and using what's called iteration to come up with explicit formulas. Um, see you in the next video. Hope you found this helpful.